Well, first, uh, I want to thank the Turkish Cultural Foundation to give me the opportunity to gather such a distinguished group in front of me for, for this lecture. And, uh, so I really enjoy uh, So um, please be hard at the end with your questions. It's not a scholar, uh, you know, one way, one way discussion, uh, okay? Um, and uh, we all, the discussions at the end are always very enriching. Um, I also, um, I'm sorry, I, I, as I say to most of you, I'm out of a um, cold, so um, it may have to, that I have to cough a little bit, or that you don't hear me well, but uh, I'll try to do my best and hold it till the end. Um, Okay, we'll just wait for the... There are spaces here. So we'll... We'll talk about uh, kilims and modern art uh, today. But uh, before I go into the heart of the matter, there are two things I want to make. Uh, the uh, first one is that I want to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Mr. Ayan Gülgenen, Dr. Ayan Gülgenen, who has passed uh, away uh, very discreetly last year in August. Uh, Mr. Gülgenen was a uh, worldwide known uh, you know, microsurgeon, uh, but he has also had a wonderful passion for the uh, uh, for the kilims and uh, carpets and all what is colored out of Anatolian textiles. Uh, and I think in his collectorship, he has taught us a lot of things. Uh, number one, he shared a lot. Uh, number two, he has basically formed our taste and he has actually keep, kept most of his things together and I think as a um, big brother for uh, for the rest of the Turkish carpet collectors uh, you know um, he, is, he is to be remembered um, probably very very well uh, the second thing is because some people in the audience may not be so familiar with what a kirin is okay? Um, I always think it's useful to show what a kilim and uh, what are the specifics. Uh, so, a kilim is something that, well, first thing, uh, sorry, because of the transfer between the images and the VGA and the projection, the colors are, are going to be not exactly uh, what they are. Uh, and uh, in some cases, the designs may not be uh, very well seen. Okay? Um, so, I will just, uh, so it's, it's actually, uh, you know, is a weft-faced weave, um, and uh, when we say weft-faced weave, uh, on a textile, uh, there's a warp, which is on the vertical direction, and a weft, which is on the horizontal <coughs> direction, and when we call a weft-faced, is that the weft is, is visible and as you see here you don't see the warp okay uh, and uh, it is made in slit tapestry technique uh, which means that uh, you know the sorry which means that the you know when the two colors the wefts between two colored areas meet they s stay separate and they do not interlock for the Anatolian kilim. Okay. Now there are um, there are obviously this technique is the base, but then there are other ways of uh, working the overall uh, kilim, like uh, you know eccentric wefts, and it is uh, inclined. As you can see in this technique, you cannot do vertical lines for a long time. Otherwise, you know you will have some, a big slit in the in the middle. And you can also have diagonal lines with the uh, contour weft wrapping or with contour weft weave in, be in between. 
okay? And the Kilim, um, Kilim weaving region, actually, ge more generally. And, you know, when I say the slit weave tapestry is mostly uh, dedicated to Anatolia, the Kilim, as a, um, using also the other <coughs> techniques, is actually going from Bulgaria up to, uh, you know, Central, Central Asia. Um, so, on this here, you can see most of the techniques. Here, for instance, you know, between, there's a vertical, in the vertical line, there is no junction. You can see the differences. You see here, here, there's, there's a slip. If I put my finger, my finger will go through uh, in there. Then you see the, the diagonal web trapping uh, and also some of the packed, packed webs, curved webs. So, um, woven for centuries by Anatolian nomads and villages, Anatolian kilims have only been discovered and started to be appreciated by Western eyes in the 1970s. Um, they have been a subject of active collecting and research in the past 30 to 40 years and started to enter museum collections both in, the Tur in Turkey and in the West. Uh, there have been serious ethnographic, archaeological, and, uh, fi and uh, field research work made, and catalogues have been written around nice exhibitions. Uh, scientific attempts to radiocarbon dating have been made. The initial efforts by the early Kilim aficionados like Yanni Petsopoulos and others have been uh, about the general classification of types and the what and where. Uh, the fieldwork uh, of uh, Udo Hirsch and Belkis Balkanar have extended to the where to whom, uh, demonstrating that the weaving communities are more important than the weaving locations uh, in the historical diversity of Anatolia, which also partially links the Kilim to the nomadic communities. Uh, the work of the first generation researchers and Kilim hunter-gatherers has earned the Kilims the status of a folk and textile art with its own and very unique character. At the same time, in this new field, many speculative theories have been generated based on dealers and collectors' wishful interpretations. The main focus has been on the symbolic content and the language of the kilims, directly linking them to old civilizations of Anatolia in full historic continuity on one side. Others argued that kilims were brought to Anatolia by the nomadic Turkic tribes and used the symbolism inherent to their religious cults and culture, uh, even um, in shamanistic and before Islamic times. A major controversy was created by an eminent archaeologist, James Millard, unfortunately based on fictive documentation about the links of the Anatolian kilims to mural paintings at Neolithic archaeological sites and to the cult of Mother Goddess. The linkage of the Kilims to the Mother Goddess in the continuity since Neolithic times has been strongly criticized with good argumentation. But modified forms of either theory captured in many publications are still very much alive on books and virtual media and continue to influence and blur the opinions of people. So all this has contributed to some confusion around the Anatolian Kilim and its understanding by the general public uh, as well as by the newcomers in the field. So, whichever of these ideas one follows today, the overall paradigm is that there was a killing Big Bang, uh, you know, in the past, which has created the most genuine, forceful, and beautiful expressions of the killing. And then since then, it has always been a constant decay and degeneration the closer we get to our time. So, this is the current approach. So, therefore, the search for the Graal is the search for the prototype killing, but if it has ever existed. However, from the beginning, the killings have spoken through their colors and forms to their admirers. Several collectors or, or dealers have acquired the killings based on their feelings about the aesthetics, and only afterwards, in the presence of the very piece, developed the theories and assumptions about the mentioned symbols and age considerations. Therefore, it's surprising that the debate on Kilim's assumed content on symbolism has relegated their aesthetic qualities to play 
second funeral. Definitely, these textiles made in the existential context of nomads and villagers carry expressions of old traditions and remnants of mankind's early symbols. <laughs> I would like to show here one example from a pottery design from Turkmenistan, Karatepe, 3000 years BC, compared with the top border of the Kirim I showed you a few minutes ago, a few slides ago. So the uh, at least the graphics and the style, stylization is, is striking. More striking maybe is if we go to 9,000 year, 9, year BC and uh, go to Kurtiktepe. And here is a mountain goat. But what's very important is that there, there's a tube which is linking the eye of the animal to, the, to its back. Well, the kitten lovers will have recognized the famous Aydan design, the same stylization, which has remained here alive for, for thousands of years. And this stylization cannot be coincidental. I still wait for seeing true photographies, I mean, photography based documentation about. Chatalayuk or other Neolithic places that link Kilim designs, uh, you know, into into other uh, into other media. Uh, but these two examples show that there is a deeper section there which goes very much. I will stop there for the moment uh, because this is part of the new research actually. So they also witness an important moment in the life of their anonymous weavers, each one having interpreted the inherited canons with their own hopes and fears. In a very individual manner, and we will come to that point, the individuality on the Anatolian Kidim versus tradition. Okay? Uh, so while brewed from tradition, Anatolian Kilims have also reached quintessence of form and color. Uh, the point which we will make through this presentation is that several examples of the Anatolian Kilim transcend the scope of the folk or textile art and raise to the level of universal fine art. <coughs> In that context, their aesthetic and plastic qualities can be best uncovered and valued in a comparison with Impressionist early abstract or abstract expressionist <coughs> paintings. In the West, the emergence of the modern art has required a definite break from the traditional fine arts in the 19th century. On the contrary, Anatolian kilims have achieved the same or even better level of aesthetic qualities through centuries of refinement in <coughs> symbolization and abstraction by the civilizations of Anatolia. A few examples. This is a Rotko. I'm glad you can't read the price. This is a section from the Kilim in San Francisco. Kupka's colored forms and this Kilim's designs seem to echo each other. This is called Rhythm Coloré by Survage. And painter called Survage. And this is written color Kilim. So, what truly distinguishes the Anatolian Kilim from other tapestry flat weaves is not so much the technique as the level of abstraction to start with. You know, all tapestry fragments from Rome or Greece are usually more descriptive as well as the ones from Renaissance or Baroque periods. And here I am taking a few examples this one, I think, is B2 to 300 BC, um, found in Afghanistan, I think. Uh, this one is Coptic, and this one is French. You know, they are tapestries uh, are much more descriptive in the way they they put things together. Even if the descriptive things can be symbolic, but they are descriptive. Um, so. 
the use of symbols in the killings led naturally to a long tradition of abstraction. Why? Because ultimately, abstraction offers the possibility to make perceptible realities that we can neither see nor describe, but feel the existence of. As the abstract painters would describe it later, actually, this is what they say. Therefore, the abstract tradition in Anatolian Kilim has parallels with the modern painting movement that moved away from academic subject forms and imitation of the nature, or what we call mimesis, to expand the color intensity in larger and free forms. Although developed in completely separated space and time, both arts uh, basically pursued the same purpose of moving from imitation of appearances to the expression of the deeper realities and the uh, essence of the human condition. So today, we are able to perceive and appreciate the aesthetics of the Anatolian killing thanks to the educated eye uh, we have gained from the modern art revolution in the Western painting that started at the end of the 19th century. I mean, this is a turner. Um, and uh, this is already very abstract and, uh, you know, very interestingly that when I looked at this and the movie that was called Turner, which passed three, which like three years ago maybe, Queen Victoria goes to the salon and uh, she looks at all the paintings, uh, you know, of all the people. Then she comes uh, in front of Turner, she said, not good, the peasant art. Like people used to say, versus the old ushaks and carpets, you know, Kilims was peasant art. This is also why still there are very few Turkish collectors <coughs> on Kilims. Now, the imitation of the nature or mimesis that was valued uh, by then in classical painting schools is put aside by the modernism, which gradually starts distinguishing the imitative or descriptive qualities in a painting from its plastic or painterly qualities. This dichotomy shapes up with the prominence of the color or the design. Um, pioneered by Turner in England and Whistler in the US, it finds its true expression with the Impressionists at the end of the 19th century. This is the famous <coughs> painting from Claude Monet, which is called uh, Soleil in Impression, Soleil Couchant, which gave the name to the current of the Impressionists. Uh, it's in Musée Marmottin in Paris. Uh, so, actually, to take the expressions of Fernand Léger, the Impressionists reject the absolute value of the subject to give it an accessory value. still identify the subjects in an Impressionist painting, but many of their contemporaries educated in the conventional art school have seen in them a mixture of garish colors with crude and less skillful drawing. The formally described subject will totally disappear with the abstraction movement that will come at the beginning of the 20th century. This will be a major revolution in the art of the painting starting with the Kandinsky, Malevich, uh, and you know, the Cubists uh, and other painting schools of the 20th century, these artists will see the canvas as a surface covered with colors arranged in a specific order. This view will even lead to abstract minimalist monochromes like Malevich, uh, you know, and I can show you, so this is uh, Kandinsky and uh, Smoldrian. Mondrian, no, this is clay, sorry. This is Malevich. Somebody recognizes his key. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So, translated to killings, the lack of mimesis or the symbolic abstraction is the fundamental property of the Anatolian killings aesthetics. Uh, from that point of view, the debate is not if a specific kilim represents the mother goddess, the animal's mistress, uh, the birth or fertility, uh, you know, or 
want to go to the female or male sexuality, but it is how it deploys and coordinates the plastic elements into a successful end. Like this. What I mean now by plastic elements, okay? Uh, the plastic elements are the factors of painterly qualities. For the definition of the plastic elements on a painting, there have been several discussions since early 20th century. For Fernand Léger in 1913, these were the line, the forms, and the uh, and the colors. For Paul Klee in 24, they were the line, the measurable forms and proportions, the tonal values, the rate of the dark and the light, and the colors. So these elements combine into an organic whole in the artwork that must be completed by two other characteristics. The extent, you know, or the size of these elements, each, each of them, and the factura. Uh, yeah, and I will come to that. To have an idea of what is meant by extent, we can refer to Matisse, who used to say that a square inch of blue is not equivalent to a square foot of blue. And, uh, you know, here in the Hermitage, you can see actually the two paintings from Matisse. Look at the blue here and look at the blue here. And it's pretty close, you know, the two. And the proportion of what you put at a plastic element place. The factura is also a term coined by the Russian artists that defines the way the materials are deployed and used in making the artwork, uh, which means the surface roughness, um, you know, and uh, how the brush stroke, etc. So, all these plastic elements could also be used for the analysis of the Kilim's aesthetics. Specifically, for the Kilim's, I would like to introduce an additional plastic element, which is rarely absent, which is the rhythm. Uh, you know, and uh, this is the effect created by the placement of the plastic elements in series of simple or complex repetitions, sometimes accompanied by changes in scale that create pleasing mind patterns. This is what I mean as a rhythm. And I will show, I'm showing you some rhythm examples here, vertical and horizontal, uh, you know, and by the different changes of rhythm also. Here is another example where different type of rhythms here you can find here, but there are also these rhythms, so there's music here going on. Uh, <coughs> okay, and uh, finally, you can see different type of rhythms on this one, as well vertical and horizontal direction. So, um, the plastic elements of the Anatolian Kilim are intimately bound to its nature and weaving technique though. The lines can only be diagonals in the slit tapestry. Long verticals, as I say, need to have complete patterns or small zigzag, uh, you know, due to the slits. Circles are hexagons or octagons. The bigger shapes are formed by creatively by combinations respecting the base weaving constraints. Very bad picture of the zone of the I mean, my picture is good. Uh, well, so, coming into color and tonal values uh, <coughs> as plastic elements, I need to take a brief moment to explain the color schemes on the Anatolian Kilims. Most people will be familiar with this base color wheel uh, with primary, secondary, or tertiary colors. Uh, overall, most good Anatolian Kilims achieve color completeness by the proper placement and sizing of the primary or secondary color contrasts. This is the red green, okay, red yellow blue, you know, red yellow blue, and then yellow green purple or blue orange. However, where the kilims express actually the mastery of color, and this is also how we can recognize the Anatolian kilim versus other kilims, is in the use of very particular shades. So, but to account for this, we need to use not the basic color wheel, but a much more um, sophisticated color system than the basic color wheel. And this is what's called, I mean, I found this, the Mansell color system. 
So this is a three-dimensional system. Here it is basically the darkness, you know, on the vertical, it is, they call it value, and this is the darkness or lightness of the color, which goes from deep black to full white. In the round, at each level, you know, of darkness or uh, lightness, you have the normal color wheel. Okay? And then, uh, in that direction, in radial direction, you have what we would call saturation today. I mean, they call it chroma, but it is saturation. You know, so a blue can be mid-saturated, extremely saturated, or not saturated at all, which will turn it into gray. Um, so, in the most successful examples, so actually, sorry, the here is actually how the the system looks like. You know, if you put the reds and blues, and, and in nature you cannot have, I mean, it's, it, normally it should be theoretically a sphere, but in nature you do not find all the values, okay? Uh, you cannot get all the saturation values, you cannot get, uh, you know, by dyeing or by, by doing other things, so that the Mansell system is actually limited by what is existing, you know? Some of the, uh, I don't know, deep purple will go as much here and there won't be more, more there, okay? So, now, if you follow me so far and you are not lost, the, in most successful examples, and here I took, you know, like a cut of the system, imagine a circle that was cut at level five of that, uh, the color used are placed into transitional areas. So a red is not is never a red. A red is actually going to either you know if if my red is here, you know so it, because it will continue here actually it goes this way, boom, then boom back to here. Uh, a red is never going to be in the middle of red. Uh, a red is going to be either in the towards the yellows or it's going to be in the blues, but. Uh, you know, and the a blue is never going to be into the into blue blue. Uh, you know, it, it will be towards blue green or maybe pinkish blue, but mostly in the Turkish uh, things to, uh, going into the turquoise. Uh, so there is a moment where actually, you know, the dyers and I don't know how how this was made. The color goes into one direction and just before falling into the other one, stops there. It stops there. And this is the, the point which gives you the richest, richest color and the best view in terms of the, you know, uh, brilliance. So by these choices, <laughs> the colors gain depth and uh, they vibrate with other tints. For instance, the pinkish and bluish reds, ochroreal, as I said. Huh? So every tint is obviously enriched also by harmonic micro variations, uh, which uh, result from the natural dyeing process this time. So the, the, this color mastery of the Anatolian Kilim is really at par with the best colorist sensibility in the modern painting. And I will show you with some examples now. Here is a a uh, painting from Matisse called uh, Zora Debout. Um, Matisse made this when he was in Morocco. So the, I mean, don't look at the person, it's, it's just look at the surface. It's uh, a green mass se which separates into four areas uh, of red with specific shades of red with variations um, with white uh, highlights and also down there's an association of this red with this ochre orange uh, and even some citrus orange here. And look at the same type of you know, uh, composition in an Anatolian Kilim where again the, the vertical, um, you know, the surface is divided into, into, uh, into four areas. Uh, and the association of the colors and the red, reds are again being associated with the uh, with the 
occur, uh, occurs again. Here is uh, a color called, well, unfortunately, obviously, they are not as beautiful as they should be. Um, and, you know, I find, I always find that this Philips colors and this painting from Matisse have the same color palette, basically, in terms of matching the, the, the color proportions and the, 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 the discussions, uh, the dialogue between them. So, several color systems can be observed in, uh, in the Anatolian Kilim, actually. You know, the first one is the full color spectrum with the primary and secondary contrasts, as we have already mentioned. However, another interesting color system used is the red and blue. Um, the system uses only half of the color uh, spectrum and plays with the variations on the U around the red and the blue. Uh, usually two reds and two blues are used. Okay. The yellow is virtually absent or is used in very small quantities. Uh, you know, so that, that would be, for instance, well, it's a little bit dark, but you know, there's always one dark, dark blue, uh, light, lighter blue or green, slightly greenish blue, and then a bluish red and a yellowish. And uh, usually the yellow, so probably because this replaces yellow, and this replaces green. So there's a uh, sense of completeness in the, and this system of red and blues still requires a lot of uh, perceptual uh, studies, uh, I believe. Now, if we introduce white into this, uh, you know, it, it spoils actually. Too much white spoils such uh, the color balance of such a system. So, um, you know, <coughs> it has to be in very, very small quantities. So the introduction of green can be made, uh, and uh, this is where we go into the karakechili kilims, etc. Or you can have also the introduction of purple, but then you have to go get a pink associated with, with purple uh, to, uh, to get this. So the extent of the colors uh, can create, obviously, the specific effects they have. So, here is a kilim, for instance, that takes this last uh, color combination here. Um, and, you know, it uses only uh, purple, pinkish red, and uh, normal red, and blue, <coughs> etc. And uh, it, it is found into the Karaman Karakuna areas, usually with the introduction of purple red composition. So it's also using only half of the color spectrum. And uh, it's interesting to note that a similar color combination was used by Picasso. In what? In uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which was an extraordinary painting uh, he did. And I was at the Met, uh, because you cannot rely on the internet colors, you know, so. I have to really go and look at it to see the two shades, but it's about uh, you know the same color <coughs> sensitivity, uh, you see, more or less. Uh. So um, looking at the now we will look at the extent uh, in color as a plastic element, uh, bursting the traditional form in drawing. Modern painters have used large colored surfaces called this aplat in French. Um, in the kilim, the color is formed by the weft itself. Um, you know, so the uh, to fully to fully blossom, the colored area has to be of a certain dimension. Uh, one can compare the different executions, like in the Sene or Ottoman kilims, uh, where actually the surface of the colored area is is very small. Uh, now it's. Some people may, may, may or may not like it. It's a different question. But it is not the same thing. It's, for me, it is not the same plastic tradition as the uh, kilim. Even the Ottoman kilims, okay? Even the colors are nice. The colored areas are not developing as much, uh, you know. So also, the tendency for reduced sized color areas 
is a sign of more recent killings that will tend to be more decorative. There's more decoration. So finally, we come to what is called the factura, or the way the materials are used to make the artwork. Contrary to painting, a killing is not made by taking a ready-made surface like a canvas, a uh, board or other support, and applying the colored materials on it. Uh, so the, you know, the applied color by the wool yarns form gradually the surface that such that it comes into being as the work progresses. So you cannot have an unfinished killing. Yeah, you can have a half a killing, but you cannot have an unfinished killing. It's a very, I mean, mentally, imagine, you can have a canvas and you can put it on the wall, but you cannot, uh, so there, this is the major difference between the two media. A killing forms itself as it is being woven. Yeah? Otherwise, it is lost, it doesn't exist. Um, so, I call this the ultimate genesis, uh, which means the emergence of the artwork and the support of the artwork simultaneously through the technique of the artist. So there's a transformation of one dimension warp into the two dimensional plane by the colors and the materials of the weft of the killing. There's no separation of the support from the colored media. Okay? There's no separation of the support from the colored media. They form a one and a unique entity. It's very specific to uh, the Anatolian king. So, I still found a close relation in the painting, uh, like Lucien Fontana, okay? He, he takes a canvas and then he cuts through it, then actually his painting becomes his, <coughs> uh, you know, the transformation of the canvas is becoming the artwork itself. Now, uh, the modern painting has freed itself from the traditional form, brought the color at the forefront, and developed the described plastic elements as the main components of the painting. Through its progress, it has adopted different parts that call themselves as early abstracts, suprematists, cubist units, etc., in early 20th century. Uh, strong parallels continue between the two art forms with the further evolution of modern painting. As can be seen from the following examples I will present, these parallels never met, but sometimes gave birth to the same aesthetics. The arts of the Kilim and the modern painting have existed in separate space and time, and in no way I am suggesting that uh, you know, the Kilims have influenced modern art. Please don't leave the room by retaining this, okay? Um, this, for instance, and I will show how this is, this is where this phenomenon is very interesting, because the, the two separate ways people came to the same aesthetic. This is a Matisse. This is a Kili. Okay. Can I ask a question now, or should I wait? Um, you may have uh, our... Okay, okay. Yes, yes, go ahead. It's better. I was just wondering, you mentioned before about the color. You know that it's an Anatolian carpet due to the unique uh, color gradations, mm -hmm. and that is not found in other kilims, you, you said? They have other family. They, have, they place themselves you know, in other places of the Mansell chart, actually. This is how I would rather describe it. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, somebody in the future has to make studies uh, like placing the specific shades of the Anatolian killing colors uh, you know, onto some chart and then taking, uh, uh, I don't know, Kashgar killings for instance or Caucasian killings and placing them on this uh, colored, colored charts, uh, you know, calibration, color calibrated charts to, sh to show the families, uh, you know, uh, now, experts obviously have this in their mind, but this is actually how they acquire their, their knowledge. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going on. Um, then, here is actually a August Mackey. You see the triangular form in the geometry. And this is a, it's obviously a baklava kili. Here is a dancer from Matisse. 
you know, what I want you to see here is actually there is a color background, okay? And there are, there is a dense, there is a more movement which is suggested by the white and blue lines and also the green ones, uh, okay, which, uh, which is completely debalanced from one way to the other, uh, one top to the other. Um, and this is, I, I find those two things close to each other. I don't know why, but I do because of the um, multicolored ground and the the, uh, the white and blue lines dancing all around. Now, in the mid 30s of the 20th century, the American abs uh, artists will be the source of a new energy in abstract painting, making the synthesis of pure abstraction, which is disciplined constructive, ob objective and clear, and also uh, surrealism, so you know, pure abstraction and uh, surrealism, which is emotional, intuitive, spontaneous and subjective. So artists among which the most prominent are Rothko, Gottlieb, Pollock, Newman, um, you know, and still will continue reducing the painting to its most fundamental elements. They will be classified as abstract expressionists. Okay, so that's uh, Gottlieb. Uh, so the, they, this group will be classified as abstract expressionists as their art will also search for a content that has the ambition to uncover some universal truth. Uh, so I am quoting from a famous statement of Rothko and Gottlieb in 1943. He says, we favor the simple expression of the complex thought. We are for the large shape because it has the impact of the unequivocal. We wish to reassert the picture plane. We are for flat forms because they destroy illusion and reveal truth. It is a widely accepted notion among painters that it does not matter what one paints as long as it, well, it is well painted. This is the essence of academism. There is no such a thing as a good paint as good painting about nothing. We assert that the subject is crucial and only that subject matter is valid, which is tragic and timeless. That is why we profess spiritual kinship with primitive and archaic art. These guys were, were going to be called uh, the myth makers later because you know the myths are going back to the UNT's first uh, first thoughts. So. We will come to the discussion of subject and content uh, a little later, but let's first look at some comparisons. Now, the kilims with an empty monochromatic field and the striped kilims compositionally and color-wise match very well in their artistic sensibility with several works from the abstract expressionists. So here is a kilim. Here is from Josephi. Here is a Rothko. Another Rothko. Kili. Kili. Rothko. And this one is Ad Reichmann. Rothko and Sieger. <coughs> Rothko. Kili. 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 Yes, and I'm coming here uh, to Barnett Newman. Uh, he is best known for the monumental paintings he began making in the late 1940s, which incorporate unified fields of color that have been demarcated into zones by vertical or occasionally horizontal stripes. Uh, so this, he called them zips. So this was a compositional uh, trick, a source of movement, division, and measurement, as well as a carrier of often metaphysical meaning. Um, so, this is called the name. Uh, <coughs> here is, this is called Vir Heroicus Sublimis. Those of you who have been at Met, this, this painting is about, I think, five meters, uh, five to six meters long, and about uh, two and a half to three meters. And, you know, they put, uh, they put a um, barrier for people, obviously. And actually, the Barnett Newman wanted people to get immersed into into this red uh, uh, universe, and actually, 
as you know, how many times have you been really opening one of your antique kilims and immersed yourself by sitting on it? You know, just do it. Uh, this is the only way you can really live the experience of the true kilim. You know, why it is there. Um, <clears throat> so, this is a Newman called the name. This is Kilim, unnamed. <coughs> this is uh, voice. Of, yeah, I think it's voice of fire from Barnett Newman. And obviously, you guys won't be surprised. Yeah. And this uh, this is called the Achilles painting, and this fragment uses the plastic elements with the same. Uh, force, you know, here from Gilgan and Collection. Um, this represents the um, red glowing shield of Achilles, you know, again, myth, uh, mythical thinking. And uh, somehow, you know, the color balance is the same. So, there's, a, I'm coming to Clifford Stills, <coughs> I found inside several killings also, either in details of oral compositions, and I go fast here. Stills, stills, <coughs> kilim. In general terms, the striped kilims and the jagged star kilims present very similar plastic qualities and the work of these painters with sometimes very original and striking variants using also the contrast and the, the rhythm. Uh, you know, like this and the, the rotko are having the same perception of power and space. Uh, this is a form of video and collection again. And uh, that's uh, stills number two. And somehow, maybe Tire Publisher, but that's fine. Uh, the black shapes in this painting from Motherwell, Robert Motherwell, uh, and they're, you know, the cycle of contraction, actually, this is very important. Big space. You know, relaxation, opening, closing, relaxation again. You know, this cycle is very close uh, to this, what it's called, uh, this, to, this, uh, <coughs> to the same, same rhythms uh, of this Vinju, uh, Vinju Kili. Um, so among the abstract expressionists, uh, Jackson Pollock has a special place. He's influenced by, partially by surrealism and Indian set painting techniques, and he introduced the dripping technique of liquid paint working on horizontal canvases where his whole body would be involved in what was later called action painting. Uh, some similarity can be observed with the result of paint strings, and the, you know, because he was just dripping it from his, uh, uh, his paint pot, and you can also think that it is a yarn, uh, you know, that you are depositing on a, on a surface, wool yarn that you, uh, okay. So he has an all over style which avoids any points of emphasis or identifiable parts, uh, you know, within the whole canvas and therefore abandons the traditional idea of composition in terms of relations among the parts. Uh, but, you know, also the killing is an over, all over execution. Because the co uh, sorry, okay. here, for instance, um, because the colored yards are important at any point of the weaving to form the two-dimensional colored surface, uh, and Fox's physical involvement, as you can see it here, uh, with the emergence of the work, his horizontal canvas and the freedom of the unconscious gesture, are, I would say, same order about the same order of the killing weaver's involvement with her loop. She is really immersed in it, especially on the horizontal one. Uh, so, killing weaving is itself a physical performance, yeah? So, it's a happening, it's a physical performance, uh, from the preparation of the materials to the final weaving. Uh, you know, the end product, yeah, okay, is there, but I think very few studies have been done, probably, probably. Um, to understand what's the total process. 
And here you see also the, all these natural uh, strings that some people can put uh, in a crazy way on, on keys. <coughs> Finally, and more because of the time constraints, I want to show a few keys that can be compared with the optical art of the late 50s and the early 60s, which put forward the pure visual impact was represented by painters like Vasarely or Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, so now, so far we have focused on the plastic elements of the kidneys and of the modern painting and have shown two examples how the abstraction as a common concept could lead both media to similar aesthetic results. However, as abstraction broke with the mimesis, the question of the subject and content of the painting appeared quickly as a matter of discussion. Um, this is somewhat different than the Kilims. The Kilim carry, carry the symbolism intrinsic to the community they were made in. Um, even in the case of empty Kilims, devoid of symbols, the specific form and the color expression had a meaning for the whole community that could read and understand it in their cultural context. Uh, this was not the case with the modern painters who had to redefine the purpose in their paintings such that the onlookers see the world as the artist see it, and not the reverse. Okay? Uh, so since Kandinsky, and uh, as we have seen with the declarations of Rodko and Gottlieb, the abstract ex artists wanted to achieve works full of meaning and spirituality. In many cases, uh, this went beyond the individual feelings of the artist to imprint with the painting's materials the emotions and anguishes of their time. Yeah. So this is called Syrian Bull, uh, from Rothko, it's actually supposed to uh, end their interpretation of Assyrian, Assyrian bull. I showed that one already. Yeah. And the Gottlieb's art employed universal symbols of his own invention that transcended time, place, and language, he says, to appeal to the level of the unconscious mind. So Picasso, impressed by primitive art, going one step further, saying that painting was not an aesthetic process, but rather the act of giving a form to fears and desires. In that sense, the purpose of the Roman Kilim and the modern painting find common ground. We have mentioned earlier that Kilims witness an important moment in the life of their uh, you know, weavers, each one having interpreted uh, you know, the inherited symbols with her own hopes and fears and feelings in a very individual manner. But let's talk now the individuality uh, of the Kilim Weaver and her intentions for artistic creation for a minute. Is there any individuality comparable to the freedom of the modern artists possible in this environment of supposed conformity? Could the Kilim be considered as grand art as it is the work of anonymous weavers, not always educated, and assumedly repeating the already developed canon of a woman media. I say assumedly because I do not always agree with this. So to express a first point of view on the subject, um, you know, I, I will turn to an important publication, which is the essays in the catalog of the Caroline McCoy Jones collection analyzing that, the status of the killing as an art form itself. This may be the first time killings are officially and uh, permanently accepted as art in a Western institution, by the way. So we have to recognize the work that has been done in there. Using the terminology of Andre Malro, the killings are classified as art by metamorphosis compared to art by destination like paintings, sculpture, etc. The expressed belief is that the killings will be fully appreciated if their differences and specificities versus the other art forms are very well understood. Clearly stated in these essays, the first quality criteria for the killings is how close to the tradition a specific work is. Uh, the primitive man or the nomad used that textile, and I'm quoting from the book, as a means of creative expression, as a repertoire of symbols, and a vehicle, vehicle of popular traditions. In that view, the assumption is that the weaver is erased under the traditional canons that are repeated from generation to generation. The kilims express collective feelings and symbols. 
leaving no or only a small place to weaver's individuality and own creativity. So, based on these ideas, you know, the, the, the paradigms are that the killing is a folk uh, or a textile folk and nomadic <coughs> art, anchored into ancestral tradition and symbols. The earlier, the better. The earlier, the better is very important. Very restricted personal creativity of the individual weaver and created for cult or collective expression, they become art by metamorphosis at the eyes of the Western observer. <coughs> so, I would like to expose a different point of view here. As Walter Gropius, has, the founder of the Bauhaus School, has nicely put it, an artist is an elated artisan. The weaving communities produce series of kilims from the same expressive and traditional forms. However, several weavers have definitely woven for art in the sense understood by their community, imprinting their own signature and transcended the media by their commitment. Taking a similarity from music, okay, could we deny artist status to a Herbert von Karajan or Arthur Rubinstein? because somebody else wrote the original partition he was playing. Yeah. Uh, so, for Henry Glassy, uh, who was an extensive research uh, the creative process in the traditional arts in Turkey in the 1980s, art is a part of common life. It is functional and is in some measure useful. It is not tied to a certain media, contrary to the Western view that distinguishes between craft and arts depending on the media. I quote, it is not the medium which makes the artist, the medium is only a biographical accident and the media of woman and poor man, which could be called crafts in the West, can be roots to art in Turkey. Art is distinguished from craft on the basis of the commitment of the artist. So, further he states an observation made also by many people who are familiar and lived alongside carpets and killings. Every piece carries the personality and signature for, of the weaver. Observing and discussing with weavers for Glassy, the work is a self-portrait. It is also an abstract portrayal of social affinities developed during the creative process of weaving. This image of self does not isolate her, but positions her centrally among her family, neighbors, and the bigger community. So it's different than the individualized artists, which were uh, you know, uh, modern artists. Um, so, here, we have to note that, especially for the nomadic communities, most research has focused on the later periods where these people lost their status of freedom and independence versus the central administration and became poorer and without power. One needs to remember the times where the nomads lived in much bigger communities with 20, 30,000 of tents when the, there were nomadic states like the Akkoyunlu and Karakoyunlu with royal courts in Anatolia. To understand that the Kilim weavers have not always been living and working at low social classes and the population. Uh, so, the rich diversity of the Anatolian Kilim designs is also a proof of the creativity of individual master weavers over time from whom newer designs must have been adopted. Therefore, my conclusion is that if there is one tradition in the Anatolian Kili, it is in the plastic elements, and probably not in the continuity of symbols or so on. Staying true to the plastic tradition, you know, the actual designs bearing the symbols have the meaning that each weaver or community attributed them at some point in time. Some of them may have disappeared. But if they kept the plastic tradition of the kilim with all the things that I have explained, uh, then you have a great kilim which moves out of the, out of the uh, cloud. Uh, they have created the weavings as functional objects, but with the pride and management <coughs> of artists. Uh, from that standpoint, most kilims were created as, uh, you know, uh, utilitarian objects, and some of them go beyond their 
their media. Now, there is still a process where a kilim become art by metamorphosis. And this is through the fragments by modern collectors. Okay? In this present station, several kilim details were compared with modern art's full paintings. The whole kilim, uh, the whole kilim does not always reflect the plastic elements as they were used by the painters, but parts of the kilim show the plastic similarities. Uh, starting from that, some fragments can be mounted on a canvas uh, and be presented as mural artworks, which can be lead to very successful results. So this is from Josephine Powell collection, and this is called the Cyclops from William Baziotis. So this is a fragment from a double Nishkini. This is well known published in Yaila, it's called the Rebellion Collection, and uh, you know, here is a composition made by sewing on canvas two remaining borders of four meters each from a lost kid. Okay. Now, I hope this presentation provided you with an insight for the appreciation of this understated aspect of the Anatolian Kilims today and uh, gave uh, some uh, clues for further research. Obviously, we have covered only the points where Kilims and modern painting have met each other in the aesthetics and fundamental purpose. For sure, like modern painting, the Anatolian Kilims have their own media forms and colors. Uh, within the boundaries of this media, the Kilims have explored additional forms and compositions where modern painting uh, has not been. Enriched with the subject content of several centuries of mankind's history, reinterpreted in the weaver's own life context, the Anatolian Kilim is part of universal fine art. The weaver's anonymity does in no way reduce the force of this art, which addresses and moves us today thanks to the revolutionary work of Western modern artists. So, I thank you for your attention and uh, close with the harmony of the three yellow dancers. Can you see them? <laughs>